The Dice Tower is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. And by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, in stock at CoolStuffInc.com. The Dice Tower, Episode 511. Puzzle me this. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, Tom and I are joined by Crystal Pisano from Board Game Blitz to discuss some recent games played, get creative with a tale of board gaming horror, and answer questions from the mailbag about using board gaming apps as practice for in-person games, games that have scarred us for life, and dealing with people who don't like us very much. Plus, Jeff talks about crystal puzzles, and we close the show by working out our top ten puzzle games. I'm Eric Summerer, and here's your host, the Edward Nigma of board gaming, Tom Vassell. Why am I a villain suddenly? Um, I don't know. It's been a slow progression. I was just going to say, this slow changing of me to the bad guy, (laughs) pretty soon I'll be like, and Thanos. Here's your Thanos, Tom Vassell. Here's the devil. The worst part is he didn't even spell Nigma correctly. I had to fix it. Oh, you! Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank a, you very much. Yeah, the not, audio listeners will be very grateful. I'm sure. Not a oh, I, I don't, geek, Eric. I don't want to annoy the the word nerd. No, that's not a good idea. <laughs> I apologize profusely. Folks, welcome to the Dice Tower. I'm Tom Vassell. Hi there. I'm Eric Summerer. And, and I'm with Crystal us today. Oh, sorry, I messed it up. That is. <laughs> She's right. She's she was here. ready to jump in. She is on the ball already. Crystal, where might people have heard you before? People might have heard me on the Board Game Blitz podcast, which is a part of the Dice Tower Network as of a few months ago. And they may have also seen me briefly on the Dice Tower YouTube channel on the Favorite Game Friday videos that come out every week that Roy Canada from Epic Gaming Night puts together. To be fair, it might be easy to miss you since it seems like everyone in the world is on these favorite game things now. (laughs) Admittedly, I was on it from the very beginning, so I feel like I have some kind of weird favorite game Friday cred, but who knows? They are turning into one of our more popular videos, so it's it's interesting to see how that works. People just like that whole thing, and they're like a life of its own. Folks, if you've not seen them – in fact, folks, if you don't listen to the – you know, you might you should go check out the video channel if you if you don't. Some of you don't have a chance to watch video. Some of our videos we put on an audio feed where you can listen to them just like this. It's called DiceTowerAudio.com. So you can go there and hear our top tens and other things. There's not a lot of Eric on that channel though. Mostly no. just introing and outroing. Well, actually there is a lot of me there. It's just I'm not saying anything of interest. You're saying the same things all the time. <laughs> over and over again. Each time, recorded each time. When I start no. an, another podcast and I hear Eric, I'm like, what, again? Turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> Get rid of that guy. So we just got back from Origins. Oh, my goodness. It, Indeed. I don't know how you can be so tired. That was your first convention in a while. Some of us have been conventioning it up. Well, that's true, but it's still, you know, long travel, late nights, and then I had to jump into work after... Come uh, late, leave early. Yeah, Exactly. We know when our setup is finished because that's when Eric shows up. At uh, they, they, they give me a lot of ribbing. I had to take my kid to camp. It is tough to have two kids. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm in a mean mood today. I got to oh, like – Oh, man. Kinda, I need to pull out of this. Stop, Vassal. All right. But it was a great time at Origins. We want to say thank you to everybody who came by and stopped at our booth, which was a lot of people. It was indeed. We had a lot of smiling faces and and happy folks. And it it seemed like uh, folks at Origins were in a pretty good mood. It's true. But, 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 but Origins is over. And we're not going to really like do a recap of Origins. It was fun. It was great. We have an Origins show we record at Origins, but we'll be saving that for a few episodes just because that's how it fits in our schedule. That's where it goes. But. We had a good time. Had a live, good live show. We have a, a new uh, a game show uh, to, to enjoy. Uh, we're just going to wait a few weeks to air it. But the excitement is now at fever pitch because now that Origins is over, there's only one con in our sights. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. <laughs> and that is Dice Tower Convention. This is 
the thing I think I'm most excited about this convention, Eric, is that we have more Dice Tower contributors and network people there than ever before. Nice. It will be my first trip to Dice Tower Con and my first trip to Florida since I was a teenager. So I am Ooh. very excited about it. Well, it's always good to go to Florida the week of July 4th. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I, yep. right now, it's been almost 120 degrees in Vegas this week. So truthfully, it's par for the course. <laughs> it's it's going to be cool for you. You're right. Uh, the humidity. Now, though. our air conditioning, I think, is better than Vegas, actually. Um, the air conditioning there is fantastic. But I am so excited. I was, I've was i been working on the, the convention this week, you know, getting ready for our shows and things we're going to do there, looking at the number of people going, checking the hall layout. To, the fact that we've doubled this year is, like, mind-blowing. It's pretty crazy. The entire convention building at the Cree Royale belongs to us now. That's right. See you later, teen beauty pageant. Bye, nuns. <laughs> I am sad to see the nuns go. I am not sad to see the teen beauty pageant go. The nuns were friendly. A few of them, a few emissaries came over to see what was going on in our giant gaming hall. Yeah, well, one of them said, like, I'm at the wrong convention. <laughs> and we said, we know. She was at the right convention. She just didn't know it yet. She just hadn't decided to stay. Anyway, folks, I'm very excited. And we don't mean to rub this in for those of you who can't come. But I'll tell you, there's a lot of people on the waiting list who have got in. Uh, there's been a lot of movement on that waiting list in mm-hmm. this last couple of weeks. Yeah. And I'm sure more of that. The the amount of publishers who want to come to the show are clamoring, and if you're listening to this show and are one of those publishers who wasn't able to get in, I very clearly said, and Eric could back me up on this, two years ago, that that was when it was time to get on board. Hmm. I said, get in now, and we'll remember you later <laughs> on. Some of you chose not to do that. You are really in a saucy mood tonight. <laughs> You really are. I've been working with kids for three hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think we said this on air, but you, you've been working vacation Bible school for the past several days as well. Yeah, I got back from Origins and went directly to vacation Bible school. Ran it for th- three hours, then went home, got up early because I'm way, way behind on Dice Tower videos. So I record Dice Tower videos all day long, run of ABS, come home, sleep, and I've been doing that all week. I am okay. s- I'm s- so on caffeine <laughs> All the time. <laughs> so that accounts for some of this. Okay. Good. But the good news is I played some great games, and the first one I want to talk about is Viral. Mm. Viral has me really pumped here because it's the newest game in the Dice Tower Essentials line. You're going to be able to see some copies of it at Dice Tower Con, but it's going to be for mass market release. Um, well, not mass market. I wish it was. But for wide release – on uh, a little bit of a, a Gen Con. Nice. Now, viral, in viral, each player is a virus, and you're infecting a body. This body is just getting racked up <laughs> with all different diseases. The best way to describe it thematic-wise is if you've ever seen the movie Osmosis Jones. Mm. Okay, so you're viruses, and it's like an area control game, and each there's six rounds of the game, and in these rounds, you're going to be playing action cards. And pairing them up with a zone in the body. So I might say, you know, like I'm going to add more viruses in the brain. I'm going to move some viruses to the heart. I'm going to, I'm going to attack viruses in the intestines. All right. And so you will do this and you're, you're going to go around fighting and try to get area control because the most in different areas is going to give you victory points. But you also have a chance to upgrade and get cooler action cards. If there's ever too many viruses in one area, it becomes a, a crisis area and the body will, that will flush it all out. And so you get some points for having controlled that area, but there's nothing there. And every time you control areas on the board, you will also be getting research points. The doctors are figuring you out. And if you ever reach a certain critical mass in research points, every single one of your viruses is removed from the body because they figured it out. Hmm. Of course, you come back the following turn to cause more havoc. <laughs> and it's really a great medium weight game. It's a beautiful looking game. It's a cool theme. It's you're not going to see many themes like this one. It takes between an hour and ninety minutes, and I'm just I am so thrilled about this game. It's from Mesa Games. They're the guys who did uh, City of Spies, Estrold 1942. Hmm. Same designers actually, and oh, it's just a fantastic game. It sounds really interesting. That's viral. I, I got to, got a chance to see it. I haven't had a chance to play it yet, but it looks very pretty. 
First up for me is an upcoming game from Queen that I had a chance to play at Origins uh, on uh, live on the air. Actually, it's Immortals, uh, which is a, an evolution of the system from Wallenstein and Shogun. Uh, it uses the cube tower much the same way it's used in those previous games. And in, in fact, uh, Dirk Hen shares the design credit with Mike Elliott here. The big difference is that the world is now split into two identical maps. One is a light side map and one is a dark side map. They have the same territories. Um, and, and you may own a, a territory or have presence on a territory on the light side, but not on the dark side. It may You may have a completely different army over there owning that one on that flip side. And so you – let's back up for a second. The, the Wallenstein system allows you to have uh, cards that represent the different territories. And then you place those cards face down on a, on a, a chart saying I'm going to take such and such action in each of these provinces, each of these territories. Um, and then everybody reveals uh, turn by turn and you, you get to do stuff. And if you steal a property from somebody else, you get to steal that card from that player. Maybe they don't get to take the action there because they no longer own that territory. This new system with the two maps allows for some interesting interaction between those two sides. Um, There's two levels of cards you can own for a particular territory. One is a control card that says you you get to use this card over and over from round to round. Uh, And then there's another one they call a conflict card that may represent a territory that you have to give back if you you use it. And that is where things get a little weird because you may have presence in a territory. You may have tons of of armies on the light side version of a territory. And then somebody takes an action on the dark side and wipes out a small little band of armies that aren't even related to you. And they get to steal your control card, possibly before you've had a chance to use it. You can steal it back. There are actions that say, I'm stronger on the light side than you are in the dark side. Give me that card back. But... Actions that don't even involve you can often mess you up in this in this system, um, which sort of rubbed me the wrong way. Uh, Wallenstein gives me a headache to begin with, with all of the, the preparation and the programming, and everybody gave me a really hard time because I was taking forever making my moves. And to have all of that, it, it seems more unstable in the th- crazy things that can happen between these two sides. Um, so I was, I was a little underwater for most of this, and... and Part of that is that I wasn't doing well, but I'm not sure if I'm happy with the system to begin with. Uh, Tom, what did you think of Immortals? Well, I really thought you are slow playing games. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's actually a much cleaner, faster system than Wallenstein and Shogun. Huh. I'm kind of surprised you're acting like it's more complex. I, I, I guess I just didn't I, – <laughs> I lost a lot of my cards. So I had to take those actions with the cards you had to get rid of. And then I was unable to take any actions with those provinces. In Wallenstein, if you have presence in a territory, you have the card for that territory. And you can continue to take actions there. And to lose it with these temporary cards, I part of that was me making a terrible blunder by using them in the first place. But then I had nothing I could do with those territories because I no longer had a card that let me take actions there. It was weird. The good thing about this, folks, is you're able to go back and watch this game. And you'll notice that in the very first turn, Eric stabbed me in the back. <laughs> Inadvertently, though. Like, well, I attacked true. somebody else, and then and you lost fair, your card. I was planning to attack Eric. <laughs> it but worked out fine. Is uh. that he hurt me, and you're not hearing me continually whine about it on this show. Now, I did go after Eric with a vengeance. That's true. In response for that. Yeah. That's just lessons to be learned. I all right. I don't right, understand now, boys, how you. Let's all be uh, nice and hug each other. And <laughs> I ain't hugging it. I will in a week and a half. Past it. Yeah. <laughs> I actually like the game a lot. I find that two world thing very interesting. Sure, it's like, oh, I can't believe you just took that card from me. That whole light dart thing is a neat dichotomy. At the same time, it's pretty much a version of Wallenstein Shogun. It's not like it's that different from those with more attacking. My mm. only thing I'm not a fan of currently in the game, because I love the Cube Tower. Cube Tower is amazing. Sure. I'm not a fan of the different races pretty much meaning nothing. Yeah, like, it just sort I, of changes your starting stats. Yeah, like I was like necromancing orcs or I don't remember what I was. And you, and you know how I don't remember what I was? Because it did, didn't matter. They did have specialized um, actions. Like there were one or two actions on each board. Yeah, but they weren't that specialized. They weren't that different and there were some that were identical to other races. 
Right, and they didn't even feel like it was that race. Right. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. So that was only my only disappointment. I wanted to – like this whole let's put two boards together thing would be a lot more interesting if it was like more diverse. Right. Like at the beginning of the game, you start out with uh, the – I was the humans and the trolls, I think. And yeah, they, you, they add them together and that's your starting armies for the game. Eh, eh. So I still like the game a lot. Don't get me wrong. That was my one negative to it. I was much more negative than you, but I think a lot of that has to do with the my my resistance to the Wallenstein system to begin with. Um, no one made you play the game. It's true, but I, I wanted to give it a whirl, and I, I guess I regret it. <laughs> and I've still never played a game with a cube tower, so that's obviously something that I need to give it. They're a super to fun. Sometime. Yeah, I've heard nothing but good things. It's I've just never had one sitting in front of me. This is the fourth, technically five, if you count the uh, stock market one from Mr. B Games. Mm. So that was Immortals. <laughs> okay, so my first game is actually an expansion to a game that I absolutely love. I recently got to try the Play Dirty expansion for Steam Park. Steam Park was originally released in 2014 and is distributed in the United States by Yellow Games. For those unfamiliar with the base game, in Steam Park, players are competing to earn the most money by building an amusement park for robots. They build different rides and stands, expand their park, and try to attract robots of different colors to go on the rides. They have to deal with specific placement requirements and fulfill bonus cards to earn extra money while attempting to clean up all of the dirt that the robots are creating when they visit the park. Uh, The game has an interesting real-time aspect in that each round, players simultaneously roll dice that will give them actions, and whoever locks their dice onto their board the fastest will get a benefit, while players who don't lock in their dice very quickly may be penalized. So the Play Dirty expansion for Steam Park includes four different modules that can be included individually or all together, and the rulebook actually says, if you know Steam Park, throw all of them in and just go for it, which is what I did the first hmm. time I tried it out. They, the modules both add to and break the original rules of the game in some interesting ways. So some of the things that are included are new stands that can be switched out with the stands from the base game, which give the players uh, different benefits, like ways to mitigate dice rolls and other things like that. Uh, A new type of robot that can pay you less money when it visits your park, but also creates no dirt. Some expansions that can be added to the existing rides of the game that will also allow for different colors of robots to be placed on them more easily. Uh, park directors, which break some of the most fundamental rules of the game, such as the placement requirements, how bonus cards get scored, and a bunch of other things. And you only pick one park director per game, so that changes based on which one gets selected. Hmm. And then there's also something new called espionage dice. Each player is given a seventh black die that they can use on their turn, but if they want to use it, they have to pay for it. It costs either $4, or if the player to your right has rolled the same symbol as your espionage die on a number of their white dice, it will reduce the cost of you getting to use yours. So, for instance, if you roll the uh, build symbol on your black die and want to use it, and the player to your right right rolled four white dice with the build symbol, you can use it for free. So it's really interesting because it actually gives you more of a reason to pay attention to what the people next to you are doing during the real-time phase of the game. The expansion also allows for a fifth player. Uh, The game originally only supported four, and while I sometimes appreciate being able to include more people in a game, that's my least favorite part of the expansion because it cuts the number of game rounds from six down to five, And when I played it with five players, it didn't feel like we really had enough time to get things up and running and Hmm. buy enough stuff. And it also felt like there wasn't really enough stands or rides available for everyone to purchase. So the five player problem aside, I really, really enjoy this expansion. And I think it's a good way to liven up a game that was already good to begin with. And if you like Steam Park, I would highly recommend checking out the Play Dirty expansion. Hmm. I got to say, I, these expansions that add extra players, it's almost always a bad idea. Hmm. I'm think, almost always, when I say, hey, it adds an extra player, I'm like, no, 
don't do it, fools. <laughs> I think the only game that I own that I've bought an expansion for that does that that I didn't mind so much was uh, Revolution, the Steve Jackson games title. They'd only mm. because it also provided the new player boards that had a lot more spaces on them. If you were still playing with the original player boards that had limited numbers of spaces, it would be horrible with an extra player. But with the extra spaces, five doesn't seem to be like too bad in that game. I'm going to disagree with you there. I, I highly dislike it with five. There's too much crossover, and I thought the bigger boards made the four-player game a little bit more palatable. That's true, especially um, if you aren't playing with the variant where you get your bids back if you don't win them. Uh, wimp variant. Healy variant. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't play with that variant for the record, but I just know that it's a thing that exists. I like that variant. Cosmic Encounter is the one I, I would say. Cosmic Encounter definitely... I like the fact that it adds more players in each of the expansions. Six is definitely amazing. But I'm struggling to think of another game that Settlers of Catan, that's a bad idea. Hmm. Carcassonne, horrible idea. I like in the rules for the uh, Battlestar Galactica expansions, they say they gave you enough to play with seven players, but that they don't recommend it. I've actually just recently played a game of Battlestar Galactica with Seven, and we technically did not do it the way it even recommends, because I was hmm. playing with new people and didn't want to have a Cylon leader in the game, so I just had mm-hmm. to kind of fudge it and <laughs> made it work. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Yeah, you know, that's true. Like, even the new Sheriff expansion, Sheriff of Nottingham, has another player in it, and I'm like, probably not the best idea to play with six players, <laughs> but people ask for it, right? So uh, yeah. you're out there. Yeah. Because we don't want to omit anybody from a game. So we always are like true. wanting more, even if the game sometimes suffers for it. It is a disappointing That's... thing when you say, oh, we could play this game. Oh, we have five of us. Oh, no, we can't play. Th- I'm sorry. You have to no, leave I'm now, never, Bob. I'm never upset about that because I just get out of a different game then. That yeah. works well with But five. if you've been really gunning for that particular game, it's sad. Then you realize that there is 10,000 other amazing games. So why wait for an expansion to come out, and then we can play that game? Or you just tell one guy to go play a solitaire game. Okay. <laughs> Here's an Oniram deck for you. You go in the corner. <laughs> and a Friday for you. <laughs> now, I'm excited sometimes about upcoming games, but this year I was excited about an upcoming publisher. Ah. And that publish- publisher is Restoration Games. Not only do they have, in my opinion, maybe the coolest logo I've seen for a board game company. I'm really happy with it. It's like an R for restoration, but it's a guy painting it on. It just looks really good. Hmm. And the whole point of this company, and I like it when companies have a, you know, a purpose, is to take older games and revamp them and bring them back. Someday they should do Fireball Island, I'm just saying. But anyway, <laughs> Everyone keeps asking, but yes. So the first one, they, there's three games that they have are, are bringing back. I think all three are coming out at Gen Con. One is, um, oh man, I'm forgetting the name of it, Indulgences, I think, which is a trick-taking game. Mm-hmm. Another one's a racing game from Kramer, which is slipping my mind. But the one I want to talk about... Downforce, I believe, is the name of the racing game. That's correct. That's why we have Crystal here, to keep us on, on, on point. Mm-hmm. And the other one is Stop Thief. Now, Stop Thief is a quite old game from the 70s in which you were hunting down a thief with this electronic device that would give you clues as to where the thief was walking around on the board. Well, we no longer need such clunky devices because, hey, we all have smartphones. (laughs) So in this game, there's a thief who is stealing things, and you are listening to sounds each turn to figure out where the thief is moving on the board. And then instead of like the old game where you roll dice to move – You now have a hand of movement cards, and you play one of those cards, and that's how far you can move. And one of the cards, when you play it, lets you pick up all your cards. But that card is usually one that's only a few spaces. In fact, each player has one that lets you move a couple spaces, and you can get a clue and find out exactly where the thief is at any given point. Problem is, you know, that's not very helpful because you can't usually get to that where the thief is. (laughs) So the thief is running around, smashing through windows, opening doors, walking through corridors, using a subway, and you're running around. And if you land on him, you can say, I'm sure the thief is here. You punch that number into the app of that spot on the board, and it will tell you if you're correct, in which case you catch him and get some money, or incorrect, in which case you pay $1,000 to the police who are irritated that you called them in for no reason (laughs) at all. So the game is fairly light. 
It's a deduction game because I'm listening and going, okay, I heard smashing of windows and then opening of a door. And I know he's in this building, so he can only be in these three spots. And sometimes I just guess. I'm like, well, he can be one of these two spots. I think he's on this one. I might as well try to make the arrest there. Hmm. So it's kind of light that way, although you can really ramp up the difficulty of the game if you want to and make it so that he'll sometimes double back or sometimes he won't move at all. He'll stay in the same spot, which is Oof. confusing. But I like it. The app adds some flavor to it. It's light and fun. It's the kind of game that they should be selling at Toys R Us. Hmm. And Rob Davio did a really good job of taking this older game and putting it into today's era. It doesn't lose the flavor of the old game, but it, it, still, but it modernizes it and adds modern mechanisms to it. And the board itself is gorgeous. They did a great job in production. If this is what restoration games are going to look like, it's going to be a good – it's going to be a great company. Cool. I'm just hoping that eventually they get the rights or whatever is necessary to do a new version of the Omega virus, and then I will be happy. Yeah, everyone has their pet game, right, that, that they're going to do. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I'm going to stop here because I know several of the games, but I think they're not all public yet. But some people will be very excited, and I'm not going to say whether one of those people's crystal. You'll never get it out of me. <laughs> I still so- own my original copy of the Omega virus from the early 90s that I got for my, like, I think, seventh or eighth birthday, and it still works. Wow. So- I'm going to someday make a top 10 list of annoying characters in games. Oh, <laughs> Probably number one is the computer and Omega virus. Oh, Good. So that stop me. thief I was help talking about. Me. <laughs> uh, they, Restoration Games has said they're announcing something at our live show, correct, Tom? At Gen Con, yes. Yes. I know what it is, too, but I can't talk about it. Well, okay, well I'm excited to find out. Me, will... too. I will remain in suspense. Uh, Second for me today is a game called Completo. That's C-O-M-P-L-E-T-T-O. This was introduced uh, to me by a listener, Ed, at Origins. Uh, This is a... It's a a number tile game uh, from Heinz, Meister, and Schmidtspiele. Uh, but it has not come over here as far as I know. It's The components are just a bunch of tiles. Um, they go from 1 to 100. Uh, you put them all face down, mix them all up, grab 22. Actually, it's actually you, you grab 17 first and put them face down in a row. And then you will draw five more, getting you up to 22. And you can place these anywhere in your line that you want. The object of the game is to get all of your numbers to be sequential. Uh, it doesn't matter if you go, you know, one to one to one, but they have to go from lowest to highest and be in sequence. Um, you do this once once you've seated your your array. You then draw one from the board, and if you can place it somewhere in your your line, you do. You were placing the face down tile that was there, and then that face down tile goes in. As you fill in your row, though, you won't be able to do that with every tile that you draw. If you can't fit the tile into a space in your row, it goes back into the center face up then allowing someone else to maybe grab it. Also, if you manage to get right next to one of your numbers, you get to take another turn, kind of like uh, the the bonus that you get from... Oh, what am I thinking of? Uh, no thanks. That's it. Like in no thanks, you get a bonus if you manage to get a number right next to a number you already have. This continues until somebody has completed their row and the game's over. It's, it's very light, for sure. Um, but there is a little bit of strategy and timing if you can look around and see, uh, here's a number that I know that I need, that I can use, but nobody else has room for it. Uh, oh, there's also one more mechanism that you've got. Instead of taking a tile, you may move a tile. So you can take a turn to move a tile that's being problematic, maybe making room for one that you know you can get. So there is also that timing that if I move a tile to make room for a tile that nobody else can use, I know I'm going to get to take it before anyone else does. Um, Still relatively simple, but there's there's a little bit of depth here. And this reminds me a little of Rummy Cube in in that level of depth. There's there's some play room in here for sure. Um, But it's it's not so difficult that you couldn't carry on a conversation or or, you know, it's probably in the realm of beer and pretzels game. Nice chunky bits. Uh, It's surprising that this hasn't made it over to the US. But uh, I definitely enjoyed my play of completo. Hmm. So, <laughs> that's, that's yes. That's, that, I'm sorry, Eric. I I I I guess I should be more more expressive than that. Hmm. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for the clarification. 
It sounds interesting. Yeah, I mean, well, you're using Eric's word. Not a whole lot of. Uh, there's nothing really to complain about. Um, it's it's very straightforward, but it was a good time. Do you know if there are any plans to for it to get distribution in the United States? I don't know. Tom okay. probably doesn't either. I don't, I don't even he, know the game exists. If he so. did know, he wouldn't tell us. So. No, no, I'm not, not allowed to go down that route here. <laughs> so many. He's been, sit- he's been sitting on that completo announcement <laughs> for some time. And I almost that's, spilled the beans. That's the big news from, from Dice Tower Con. Clearly, it's the completo <laughs> announcement. All right. Well, what's your last game, Crystal? All right. My last game is a small box game from the Japanese company Oink Games that was released just this year in 2017 called Startups. In Startups, players are dealt each three cards from a deck containing cards representing six different companies. Each player also starts with 10 capital chips that are worth one point each at the beginning of the game. During a player's turn, they will either draw blindly from the deck or take one of the face-up cards from the market, and then they will play a single card either to their tableau in front of them or back to the face-up market. Once a player has played the most cards of a single company to their tableau, meaning that they've played more of that company's cards than any other player, they must take the anti-monopoly chip for that company and are no longer allowed to pick up cards for that company from the market until Hmm. another player has surpassed them. So once somebody else has played more cards of that company to their tableau, then the anti-monopoly chip passes and the first player will then be allowed to pick them up again. So when players choose to draw from the deck rather than the market, which is obviously how you would theoretically get cards of a company that you already had the anti-monopoly chip of, you actually have to place one of your capital chips on each card in the market pay for the ability to take from the deck instead. <laughs> so you don't you don't even know what you're going to get and you have to pay for it, which is hmm. it makes acquiring more cards of a company that you have a potential monopoly in both difficult and potentially expensive. So once the deck runs out, then players add all of the remaining cards in their hand to their tableau, and the player with the majority of shares in each company gets paid by each other player who has any shares of that company. So the wow. only way you will score for a company is if you have the most. Everyone else who has cards of that company has to pay. And the coolest part is they pay one chip, one capital chip per card, but when they pass that chip over, it flips to its backside, and it's now worth three points instead of one. So, uh, And if there's no majority shareholder for a company, then no one gets paid. Hmm. Uh, the different companies have varying amounts of cards in the deck, and that's visibly shown on the cards themselves. Like one of the companies will only have, you know, six or seven cards in the deck and another might have 15 or so. Um, the game can actually accommodate up to seven players. And I have played it with seven. I guess this is going to be similar to what I said earlier. It's You can play it with seven. I don't think it is best at seven. I think it probably shines better with four or five. Because with seven players, you the number of turns you got was far less. And there it was harder to mitigate the luck of the draw in that regard. But with less players, there's a little bit more strategy to when do you keep the cards in your hand? When do you play them to your tableau? Do you want somebody to know that you have three shares of that really valuable company? in your hand that you're just holding on to or do you want to take the anti-monopoly chip now and try and see if you can draw some from the deck i love this game it's really great it's simple to learn it's quick to play uh it fits in your pocket and it's a whole lot of fun uh i know that distribution for oink games in the united states seems to be somewhat limited i think you can get them uh on amazon occasionally for around like 20 25 dollars uh if you like if you like stock market games but think they're too complex, I guess this is probably the lightest stock type game I've ever played. And hmm. really, you could teach it to just about anyone. So I highly recommend the Oink Game Startups. Hmm. I've right. heard a lot of good things about this one as well. My my wife's coworkers picked one up, and and I hear a lot of folks going uh, are coming back from Tokyo Game Market with copies of this one. So it's getting a lot of buzz. I don't know. I'm going to wait to see it before I decide. I, I'm not sold, not because the description's bad. I'm just not sold yet. Hmm. Have the Oink hmm. Games folks ever made it to Gen Con? 
No, but they're coming this year. Are they? Yeah, they're going to be at Gen Con with a booth, and that should be interesting. They for will be popular. Reasons. Yes. All right. Well, that's enough for games. Let's go horrifying. Indeed. And now, another tale of board gaming horror. Oh my, that's horrific. Gather round, children. Last summer, my oldest daughter turned ten. She's a great kid and has been playing board games since she was as young as three, beginning with Angry Birds, then Kids of Catan, King of Tokyo, the D&D Adventure System, Galaxy Trucker, and others. My point is that she is being raised as a proper gamer. She wanted a sleepover with her friends as her birthday party. Ten little girls would be invading our house for the evening, and we'd need to keep them occupied, lest we have another round of 3 a.m. sack races like two years prior. My wife and I had movies, snacks, and party games at the ready. As this was a diverse, young crew, we suggested games like Headbands, Seen It, and Pie Face. Yes, Pie Face. Russian roulette for children. What a great idea. Let's take sweetened dairy and make it a potential projectile. But it's huge with the kids, and given their age, it was irresistible. Within moments, they were Snapchatting and Instagramming one another, covered in whipped cream, giggling and howling and screaming. My wife and I were exhausted by midnight and bid them a good evening. We pleaded that they calm down, watch a movie, be generally quiet, and no 3 a.m. sack races. They complied, and we retired to our room. We awoke to screaming, laughing, and general preteen merriment, but in the middle of the night. I went downstairs to ask them to keep the noise down, play, and talk, but be quiet about it. I was unprepared for what I was about to see. They'd run out of whipped cream for pie face. They improvised. There was grape jelly all over. Their faces, their clothes, the walls, the chairs, the table. My youngest daughter's stuffed rabbit, making him look like an extra from Watership Down. I did my best to keep my cool, and we cleaned up. I went back to bed. Honey, what were they doing down there? I thought for a second. Why should my wife lose a night of sleep as well? Just playing pie face. No big deal. We cleaned up, and they're going to sleep now. I can look back now and laugh. What a mess but it must have been pretty funny to see someone get slapped in the face with a pile of grape jelly. <laughs> you know, every time I think that, we're like, ah, these stories are starting to be same, someone comes with one that surprises me again. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't think you're ready for this jelly. <laughs> No, I think it's pretty funny because what he said about the wife is true. If I went up to my wife and said, yeah, they were doing it with grape jelly, but don't worry about it. She would go down anyway. Yeah, exactly. You didn't clean exactly. up. Like, ah, I'm pretty. So, yeah, we did not do it with grape. We did it with chocolate syrup once. Wait, how would it, how uh, would it fling chocolate syrup? It's too liquidy, right? No, you put it on a little plate with whipped cream and then a chocolate syrup on top of that. Oh, ho, ho. that's next level pie face. Ask me if it's a wise uh. idea. Is it a wise idea, Tom? It is not. <laughs> Why do you keep... There's a lot of things... You've done that... this with pie face. You've done this with toilet trouble. Adding... Oh, yeah, the yellow food color. <laughs> ...to the system. It's not supposed to do that. Oh, man. Look, they didn't put on the box, like, that many restrictions, so I do what I want. Uh-huh. Yeah, sure. make it your own. Make it your own. We're going to play pie face with tuna fish these, next. These game designers don't know who they're messing with. That's right. Hey, speaking of that, Pie Face, the dual Pie Face is not as good as Pie Face, just as a heads up yeah. for everybody. Okay, yeah. Because uh, right. both people are hitting a button as fast as they can, 
and it makes the hand go back and forth and eventually hits somebody, which sounds good, but the hand shakes too much, the whipped cream might fall off. Right. And it yeah. lacks the tension that the, the roulette one does. Exactly. There's no suspense. Someone's going to get hit the, in the next 10 seconds. Yeah, and it's just kind of meh. It's like crossfire. And their hands are going to hurt after the fact. <laughs> exactly. All right. I'm just exhausted. Well, enough of jelly. Let's go to Crystal. Not Crystal, but Crystals. Three, two, one, go. It's time for Game Tech with Jeff Engelstein, where we find out how games really work. Crystals have captured humanity's imagination for... Well, probably as long as there has been humanity. If you polish a crystal, light will dance and sparkle throughout in a mesmerizing and mystical way. Crystals have led us down a number of amazingly fascinating roads throughout history, both scientifically and in games. I mean, seriously, what would D&D be without gems? But I'd like to focus today on that sparkling light and how learning to solve a particular type of puzzle revolutionized our knowledge. Now, crystals create dazzling patterns of light because of their repeating internal structures. Their atoms are arranged in very specific ways. Those structures form spontaneously and are examples of what is called self-organization, which is another fascinating topic I should get to sometime. But back to the structure. The repetitive nature of crystals is what causes the optical effects that they are known for. Now, light waves, like all waves, have peaks and valleys. When two light waves meet up, they will interfere with each other, and the result will depend on whether the peaks meet up with other peaks, making bigger peaks, or the peaks meet with valleys, canceling out and leaving nothing. If light from a single consistent source, like a laser, passes through a crystal, some of the light will go straight through, and some may bounce off of different layers inside the crystal. Depending on how many times it bounces, and from what, the light will take slightly different longer to reach, say, a piece of paper held on the other side. And depending on the wavelength of the light and those distances, you'll get a pattern of light and dark spots called a diffraction pattern. In 1912, scientists realized that if you were clever and a good puzzle solver, you could take the diffraction pattern and use it to figure out where the atoms were in the crystal. But you would need to use light that had a wavelength about the same size as the space between the atoms, which is much smaller than visible light. Fortunately, x-rays had just been discovered, and they were exactly the right size for this type of work, and the technique of x-ray crystallography was born. X-ray crystallography really was extreme puzzle solving, especially before the advent of the computer when much of this work was done. You would take your sample crystal, get an x-ray diffraction picture, rotate it slightly, zap it again, and so on, repeating that hundreds of times. Remember that these pictures are not what we think of as x-rays that show your bones. They are just a pattern of dots and you have to look at those dots and work backwards to see what pattern of atoms would result in that type of diffraction pattern. It was painstaking and time-consuming work, but gradually we got better at it and were able to start making crystals of proteins and other biological molecules and figuring out what the structure had to be to create those patterns. X-ray crystallography perhaps reached its greatest triumph in the 50s. In 1952, Rosalind Franklin and her graduate student Raymond Gosling took an X-ray diffraction image of DNA molecules as biologists were struggling to understand the structure. What became known as, quote, photo 51 was shown to researchers Watson and Crick without Rosalind Franklin's knowledge in somewhat murky circumstances. But it turned out to be the key they needed to figure out the double helix structure of the DNA molecule. By the time Crick and Watson won the Nobel Prize for their discovery, Franklin had already passed away, or it is likely that she would have shared in the award. The techniques developed for X-ray crystallography were later adopted for CAT scans and MRIs, so its legacy continues to cast a long shadow today. There's a terrific board game that gives a flavor of how X-ray crystallography works, called Black Box. It was published in 1977 by Parker Brothers and Waddington's, and has been reprinted many times since. Black Box is a deduction game. One player secretly hides balls on a grid, which represent atoms. The other player then fires rays into the grid, and they may bounce off the balls and emerge in a different direction, reflect back, be absorbed, whatever. By shooting the rays into the grid and seeing what happens, the player attempts to deduce the location of the balls. If you've never played Black Box, I don't believe that it's still in print, but there are several web implementations that you can check out, or it's easy to make your own set to try. 
Black Box admirably gives you a simplified understanding of what's required to take those dots and lines of an X-ray diffraction and work backwards to puzzle out what could have created it in the first place. Black Box and X-ray crystallography itself are both metaphors for the scientific method as a whole. Start with something known, end with something known, and try to figure out what happens in the middle to cause it. It's a very tricky puzzle game, but one certainly worth playing. Now, before I go, please indulge me for a quick announcement. 2017 marks 10 years that Game Tech has been a part of the Dice Tower podcast. To commemorate the occasion, I've pulled about 70 of my favorite segments into a 300-page book. I'm launching it through Kickstarter, so if you're at all interested in either a digital or hardcover version, please take a look. Just go to Kickstarter and search for Game Tech, that's G-A-M-E-T-E-K, and it should come right up. All the tiers, including free shipping, anywhere in the world, so I hope that helps out our international listeners. The campaign runs through July 10th, so if you're listening after that, I apologize, but otherwise I hope that you do get a chance to check it out. Thanks for all your support, both with this and over the years. This is Jeff Engelstein with Game Tech. Well, congratulations to Jeff for writing a book. and That's pretty cool. I'm excited to see it. I, I back that one for sure. I, I just want to see the pictures. And congratulations to Crystal for having the most on-the-nose game tech ever. I would like to think that, like the crystals he discussed, I have been capturing humanity's imagination for the entirety of my life as well. <laughs> well, you took that to a much higher level than yeah. I was. I was just being nice, but you're like, wow. I mean, he said crystals have been capturing humanity's imagination, and I'd like to think right. that I can live up to that distinction. You are a crystal, of course. Okay, yeah, it makes sense. I've been one my whole life. <laughs> I've there got you nothing go. but... Have, have either of you actually played the physical version of Black Box? No, but I want to. It sounds interesting, but yeah, I have not actually ever seen it. I've only played, uh, like, digital implementations. Um, Brett Spielwelt, the, the German gaming site, had a version uh, many years ago. They may still have it up there. But it was sort of like a solitaire time waster, and, and it would generate a random puzzle, and you could send a proton into the box, and it would give you a result, and you had to sort of figure out where the, the marbles were. Isn't that uh, just I enjoyed like an it. app, Eric? I mean, I don't see how it's any different. More or less. Um, I, I always wanted to see the physical version and actually give it a whirl. It's been on my wish list since I heard about it, but I've never actually played the real version. The physical version sounds more interesting, like seeing the actual laser go in one spot and come out a completely unexpected place sounds more interesting to me than seeing a digital implementation of that system. I'm not sure you actually get to see a laser in the physical version either. I think you're, you're playing against someone, someone has set up the puzzle, and then you, you give them, I'm shooting the laser from here, and they go, oh yeah? Well, here's where it came out, and here's the result. Eric, you're uh, ruining the magic. Yeah, I know, on. I really I, am. I need crystal magic, Eric. <laughs> well, then you need an app, because that's the only way to make it happen automagically. All right, I guess I'll take the app. It okay. is question time. Tom. 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 Uh, yeah, Tom. Tom. Hi, Tom. Tom. How many meeples tall are you? How many game pieces have you broken with that gavel you use? If you could eat at a restaurant based on any game, what would it be? And now, the Dice Tower will authoritatively, definitely, possibly, maybe, answer your questions. Uh, Tom, which way to the game library? We're going to start out with Benji here, and he has three questions. Question number one, he says he was at Gen Con, squeezing through things, and he saw the Dice Tower guys. And his wife knew Tom, but didn't know anyone else. And he says explaining the other four people, which was Eric, Z, Sam, and Jason, that they were the four horsemen of the Tomacalypse. <laughs> Do you have a fun name for the Dice Tower entourage? It was Tomacopalypse. Tom, Tom. Oh, I, I said Tom it wrong. Tomacopalypse. You're right. It should be Tompocalypse, I feel. Tompocalypse? Yeah. Yeah. I'm very hesitant to say that there's an entourage. I... We do follow you around a lot. Like, what, yeah, what, what's happening really next, fast, Tom? So and then Tom blazes off. off or like, oh, better, we better follow him in case he gets lost. It's not quite like that. I try to ditch him. <laughs> so I can go off and have secret meetings. But yeah, yeah, it's true. You can't follow. Looking for a new co-host. You stay in the booth. Yes, that works. So it's, yeah, I, we don't really call us anything. You know, we're just the dice tower, really. I, that's not very exciting, I guess. I don't have a cute name. Okay. Maybe we should try and come up with something better. Let's go to serious questions. Um, he says he goes to 
um, several game conventions over the course of the year. And he says that when he meets new people, that the conversation and com- camaraderie are great, but no one ever wants to talk about their job. Hmm. And he thinks it's a good way to learn about someone, and he likes to talk about his job. And why does no one ever want to talk about their job? I have actually never run into this. I always ask people about their jobs. I find it fascinating to find out what people do. Yeah. I haven't run into that problem either. I gamed with a police officer, somebody who reads books for a living, <laughs> um, someone who reviews games for the Dice Tower. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you have a very specific sphere that you hang out with, apparently. No, but I mean, really, I, I do like to talk to people. If, I don't always ask because I forget sometimes, but if I think about it, I'll say, I'll ask what they do because I find that thing fascinating. I just, sometimes, uh, you know, I'll meet someone and I'm like, you do that? I have a gazillion questions. Right, yeah. It is, so, it's interesting know. to see how many different types of professions you are represented within the gaming community. And I know that I've heard like there is a larger amount of people who work in, say, uh, tech hobbies or tech hobbies, tech professions, like IT professionals and things like that. But I've run into just about everything you could imagine. Uh, I, I haven't really noticed a, a specific aversion to it, although that's not my go-to question. I usually, at a convention, will ask where people are from and launch off from there. But that often leads into what someone does in that hometown anyway. It just, for some reason, isn't my first question. But I haven't really felt a resistance. It's not my first, but it's it's just a fascinating thing to me. Like, I ate, I ate lunch with someone this time, and they're a doctor on an Indian reservation. Oh, and neat. I was like, wow, that's so fascinating. I don't know. I just I find that's, a, that's just neat. So, uh, his last question from Benji, he says, one time, this, this starts out so nice, at Origins, I was playing a game to where the dice, close to where the Dice Tower was recording publisher interviews. I was excited to be close to the action and ask my fellow gamers if they listened to the Dice Tower. I was surprised at a very negative response. Through further conversation, I learned one of the players had designed a game that had been negatively reviewed by Tom. Uh-oh. Could have been Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you vastly promote the hobby and increase profits for most of the industry, but since you are not adjacent and everything is not awesome, your negative reviews also affect the sales and thus money designers, publishers make. The question is, are you aware of an anti-Dice Tower sect in the hobby? I know where they hide, yeah. Eric leads them. <laughs> do they have a secretly. lair? It's like he's under- <laughs> I imagine they do. When they get together at meetings, Eric's actually the leader. He just has a mask on. <laughs> <laughs> in all seriousness, this is very true. There are going to be people who don't like us. There are people out there who really hate the Dice Tower. There's a lot of people who don't like the Dice Tower. And honestly, there's not a lot we can do about that. The only way to get everyone to like us would be to be completely inoffensive in everything that we say. Mm. And if we did that, we would say every game was good. But if we said every game was good, there'd be people who didn't like us because we said that. Right. Basically, as you gain notoriety, not just in board games, but in life, it doesn't matter where you're located, eventually some people will love you and some people will hate you. And I, it drives me crazy when people complain about stuff like your all's videos online. I, I'm actually a moderator on the board game subreddit on Reddit and mm. occasionally, and I know Tom, you post there sometimes, and I'm so happy that you come in there and actually post. Thank you. Please keep doing that. Uh, but there are people who will complain about the most mundane and ridiculous things for no reason whatsoever. And I know that people on the internet just like to be angry to be angry, but I, I will literally never understand why people are compelled to do things like that. It just doesn't make sense to me. Don't get me wrong. I can quite understand why a designer would not like me if I trashed their game. I don't think we're as powerful as people think. It's not like I think we have destroyed their livelihood. First of all, very few people are making a livelihood from designing board (laughs) games anyway (laughs) or publishers. I don't think we hurt publishers. Um, But at the same time, I just get really excited about games, and I think it's important and important to our audience to speak about them truthfully. And there are people who don't like us. I'm arrogant. I'm egotistical. I'm this and that. And Man, I try, especially at conventions, to meet people and talk to them. And if I notice that someone's online and says negative things about me, and I will take note of your name. And if I see you at a convention, we will have a discussion about that because I find that sort of thing fascinating to talk about in person. Although I found out that people are not as keen on that. (laughs) I'm like, I know you. you You're far more intimidating in person, Tom, just so you know. I'm not not, sure if you've realized that. He's not intimidating. Being – he's – I mean, to, in the board gaming world, I would say Tom is what qualifies as a celebrity, and that in and of itself can be somewhat intimidating. But 
No, he's talking about the size. It's the height oh, okay. advantage. I know yeah, he can look he down. He was making a you. fat joke. <laughs> a tall joke. It's different. It's a tall joke. It was very but much so. Yeah. I, people are always going to say things online that they would never say to someone's face, and there's probably not a lot we can do about that. But I, I think that would be that's awesome. That if you've ever actually approached someone and been like, "Oh yeah, I know you," that's very cool to me. <laughs> well, I think it's interesting. I actually did this at Origins. Talked to several people who had posted several things, and I thought, well. I don't want to get into fights online. Let's talk about it in person. Yeah. And you'll find that most people are much more mild in person. Although, not all are, <laughs> as I learned this origin. Oh. But most most people are. Excellent. I'll tell you that story later, Eric. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that <laughs> one. What's the next question? Stefan uh, has downloaded some apps like Ticket to Ride, Splendor, Patchwork, Star Realms, and enjoys playing them solo. Uh, he likes the games, but is now wondering if he's now gained an advantage having played many games on an electronic device compared to a player new to the game or somebody who hasn't played that often. And does that impact on his enjoyment playing them with other people? I know the AI might not be perfect and you might think you are doing better than you really are, but I feel I might get an advantage. I feel a little guilty when I suggest the game now. I avoid reading strategies and recommended gameplay for a game on Board Game Geek since I think it's more fun to explore yourself. But by playing the digital version, you kind of practice the game. To play the app version is good to get the rules right or trying it before buying the game or if you usually aren't get going to get to play the game. But I found very easy playing the quick games a lot. Maybe you've had some similar experiences. It certainly makes it easier to play many games in quick succession and get over that hump of understanding, you know, becoming fluent in the rules and just intuiting how the game works so you can focus on strategy. Well, you definitely learn, like, for example, with Ticket to Ride, if you play it enough online, you'll learn all the tickets. Right. You can see where people are going and, and know that, oh, they're going that direction. They have one of three routes. Okay. I guess if I, I meet someone and they're like, hey, do you want to play Ticket to Ride? And they're like, yeah, I play it hundreds of times online. I'm like, oh, we're playing a different game. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's happened with me with some apps. I've felt like I've kind of become more of an expert because of being able to play it on the app. But the opposite has actually happened to me as well uh, with the Galaxy Trucker app. I found that after I had played the app version where it automatically kicks back a tile that's placed illegally – I had trouble playing <laughs> the physical board game because oh, those placement yeah, you couldn't, you didn't rules, have that as a crutch. I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't as used to having to pay that much attention to the placement rules because the app would always just kick stuff back. And so right. when I was like, oh gosh, I actually have to pay attention to this. It was more difficult. You have to be your own cop. <laughs> All right. So Benji from Connecticut. This is a different Benji. Oh yeah, this is a different, different Benji. <laughs> He, he writes in and says uh, he enjoys listening to the Dice Tower's reviews of games, and he's enjoyed the new format with a third special guest. I hope that I can live up to those expectations for him. <laughs> he says the reviews on the Dice Tower are always a great starting point for him you know, when he's making purchasing decisions. Often he purchases a game, but then after a single play or maybe two, he decides that he doesn't want it in his collection. He's been thinking about why this might happen, and he's instituted a new rule for himself that he can't purchase games until he has lost the game at least once. And if he hmm. still enjoys it after losing it, then the game can go into his collection. So his question is, do any of us have rules that we self-impose on ourselves before purchasing a game? And he reads Tom's... But what if he keeps winning the game? <laughs> <laughs> he was trying to read your mind there, I think. Yeah. So, yes, if he keeps winning the game, he says that he will – does that mean he won't purchase it? The answer is yes, but he has never won a game more than three times before eventually losing it. <laughs> nice. It's funny that he put that in there because I would have asked that question. <laughs> exactly. He knows you so well. Um, <laughs> this would never actually affect me at all. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I I'd be like, oh, I can buy lots of games, baby. <laughs> For me, personally, I didn't used to have any rules. Basically, if I watched a review on the Dice Tower or heard about it on a podcast or saw it in a store and it looked interesting, I would just buy things on a whim. And as my mm. collection has grown, I realized that was not a very smart way to approach things because I have games sitting on my shelf that I've never played before. So my 
mostly rule of thumb that I break occasionally is I generally try to play a game at least once before I purchase it for myself. And I don't always stick to that, but I've found that my collection has become more filled with games that I am wanting to play on a regular basis as a result of that rule. Hmm. I, I think, I mean, this is, this is really not a bad philosophy. If you'd like a game after you've lost it, that's, that's a good sign. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely true. Um, similarly, I think, uh, I know that a game is one that I want to own and seek out after playing it. If it has stuck with me, if I'm still thinking about that game, uh, hours or even days later, man, I should have, what if I had done this? What if I had gone this direction? It, and that's one that I, I feel like I need to add to the collection if, it is, if it's made enough of an impression to stick with me. And usually it's because I lost because <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how, how I could have done better in the future. Um, and, and so, yes, yeah, similarly, I have a, a similar rule, but I don't follow it um, a lot. If there's one rule that gamers should always be allowed to break, it's our self-imposed buying rules. <laughs> Yeah, I guess. That's a dangerous door to open, Crystal. <laughs> People are going to come back to this episode and say, remember when remember? Crystal said I can just pretty much do whatever I want. <laughs> I mean, if people are taking my word as law, then we have bigger problems than people purchasing more games than they need to. <laughs> well, anyway, Darren says he wants to know, can we tell him of a game that has scarred us? Citadel. He's... <laughs> He's imagining a game that's never left our memory, Citadels. like a gaming session that's gone awry, Citadels. and maybe a, the theme was so enveloping that we never quite shook its effect. He says it doesn't need to be negative, mm-hmm. which is weird because I'm pretty sure scarring is very rarely used in a positive light. What a happy scar! <laughs> Scars can be a fond remembrance of victory or camaraderie. I love this scar. Um, I mean, if you donate a kidney? <laughs> I get, that's a happy scar. You're right. <laughs> I stand corrected. That is... That's true. Also, C-section. Yes. See? There you go. Um, there you go. I don't know many people that show them off, though. <laughs> or to, I mean, you can talk about them, maybe. I don't know. No, people are proud of scars, right? They're like, yeah, see this here? That's when I was stupid and ran a chainsaw inside. I'm like, yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> Good for you. Um, well, Eric's is pretty easy. I even know Eric. Right. It still sticks with me, though. I, I mean, my blood pressure goes up every time I think about it. Even when people what like... was it again, Eric? Can you... It, what game? Citadels! <laughs> it's been like 20 episodes, people. We got to do it. It's like a relief valve. Got to relieve the pressure. Yeah, I played some... I mean, my first diplomacy game, I want to flip the table, punch people. Um, cause I was, and I was playing with Bob, who's like one of the nicest gamers and he stabbed me in the face, not in the back, just the first turn. He's like, yeah, I'm going to attack you here. And I was like, what, what, but I thought we were going to have a deep, I, I hate mm-hmm. you. And I really, for a moment hated him, <laughs> except the poem a really long time. So it was like seven hours. I hated him. And I was so like, I had headaches and I was like, I want to kill everyone at the table. Mm. No one's my friend. They're pretending to be my friend. What's going on here? The is very scarring. Yeah. Uh, anyone who listens to my podcast knows that I am absolutely in love with Battlestar Galactica. And yeah. uh, probably two or three years ago, I was teaching a group of my friends who mostly hadn't played the game before. And a buddy of mine, who shall remain nameless, uh, was human. But obviously, during the course of the game, no one can know that for sure. And I was trying to suss out who the possible Cylons were. So I threw him in the brig attempting to gain information and he became so sour at being thrown in the brig that he decided to act like a Cylon for the rest of the game even though he was human and Ah. my emotional attachment to Battlestar Galactica is is higher than it probably should be and he (laughs) fully ruined that experience for me and I still haven't completely forgiven him for it but needless to say Mm. the two of us have never played Battlestar Galactica together again (laughs) <laughs> Sorry, am I supposed to be sad? <laughs> yeah, that beats any more stories I would have had. You win, Crystal. I want a thread in our forums on this. Games that have scarred. Mm. Somebody start one. Because it would be fascinating to read these things. Let your hate out. <laughs> let us all join you and so we can make you feel better. It will make you stronger. Speaking of hate, let's get to our top ten. Huh? It's a dice tower top ten. 
The Dice Tower's Top 10 list is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com. Hey, puzzle games. There's a lot of times when you play a game and you sit there and go, this is a puzzle that you have to solve, or they're multiplayer puzzle type games. So I banned escape room games from this. <laughs> but he didn't tell anybody until today. Well, no, wait. We can actually it, look at the editing thing and see when I added that because I yeah, feel like it, it was it, – It was in there the whole time. <laughs> it's possible I didn't look at the document until this evening. <laughs> but here's the thing. If, if escape room games were there, they'd be like my top five games. I, I can't – I got to take them out. So we can <sighs> say that we love escape room games and they're awesome, but they've been omitted because they would kick out a bunch of other wonderful games. It was going to well, be my number one. Well, that's, that's the thing, though. A lot of people like games where you are doing some sort of Tetrisy behavior or connecting things together or you know solving a puzzle, and that's a little bit different than escape rooms. Escape rooms are a very specific subset of puzzle games, not quite the same thing. Unlocks cards have puzzle pieces on them. I understand that, Eric. This is a okay. capricious decision I have made. All right. Yes, sir. Yes, Bob. Oh, no, don't do that. <laughs> Eric beats me off camera, everybody. I just want you to know that. <laughs> uh, All right. Okay. All right. Well, let's get, let's get going. Our, our show time is getting, getting thin, and we don't have a lot of crossover here, so we need to get started. Number 10. Number 10 is Master Labyrinth. This is the sort of slightly advanced version of the Amazing Labyrinth from Ravensburger. Uh, the, it's puzzly because you have this whole array of, of passageways, and you're trying to get to ingredients sort of in numerical order. And in order to open up a passageway that lets you get to this ingredient, you have to slide one row. You have like one extra piece in the, in the array, and you slide it over, uh, moving all of the pieces in that row over and hopefully opening up the passageway way so that you can get to the ingredient that you're going for. Uh, it's, it is quite puzzly. How do I get from point A to point B with this one tile and the movement of a row? Master Labyrinth, my number 10. My number 10 is Swish. Now, Swish. there's actually a Swish Junior, Swish. if you want, but Swish is from Think Fun, and it has all these transparent cards with like uh, circles and then dots. And you need to look at the – there's like a grid of cards on a table and figure out if I stack several cards on top of each other, every dot will be in a circle of that color. And you can flip them and you can – but and you're going to have to probably use more than two cards sometimes. And it's very puzzly, but I really like it. It's some fast thinking, stacking, clear card fun. Swish. My number 10 is Five Tribes. While a normal Moncala board can provide some puzzly decisions on its own, Five Tribes takes that Moncala puzzle to a whole new level by incorporating the different meeples' uh, special powers and the different paths that you can drop meeples onto in hopes of both setting yourself up for future moves or simply trying to prevent your opponents from getting an epic move on their turn. So my number 10 is Five Tribes. Number nine. Number nine for me is patchwork, which is uh, very literal in the puzzle element because you, you have a board and you're trying to fill in all of the spaces and you have a hole that's a certain shape and you're looking to fill that shape, that hole, and you need a shape that fits that hole and to put it together like a puzzle. And that's the major mechanic of patchwork. It's my number nine. Interestingly enough, Patrick has more competition these days. This sort of thing seems to be very, very popular. We'll talk a little bit about that more later. My number nine is actually higher on Eric's list, but I feel like I got it done first with no mistakes. Mm. My number nine is a game called Mord M. Arosa. It is probably not as well known as some of the other games on my list. In it, you are attempting to both solve a murder and absolve yourself from looking guilty of that murder by dropping cubes into a multi-level tower and trying to listen to which floor of the tower they landed on so you can locate them later. It's silly, it isn't very deep, and it has to be played in a quiet room because you have to hear where the cubes land. But puzzling out whether the cubes landed on the fourth floor or the fifth floor, and trying to determine what other players you want to call out to try and set yourself up as getting the least amount of points, which is how you win the game, it's lots of fun. Mord Imarosa, my number nine. I'm not this sure this has been this on is my a list to try. Puzzly game. <laughs> puzzly and puzzle 
are two different things. I think. I think this and- is just a sheer <laughs> guessing game. Have you? I mean, I played this. It, it's it's fun, but when I hear them fall, I'm like, uh, level five. I don't know. I I think <laughs> after multiple plays, some of my friends and I have gotten pretty decent at it. And but that's not a puzzle. Listen- You're just hearing. You're just well, listening. I'm puzzling out where the cubes fell. <laughs> Maybe the puzzle is assembling the tower in the first place? That's not really very puzzly, so I can't no. even use that as an excuse. Okay. Eric is I like the nicest it's, it's stupid fun. Ever. <laughs> number eight. I was all ready to talk about my number eight. It was, it was easy. I was ready to go. But then I noticed Tom has it on his list, so I will limit myself. And I won't talk about it right now. Mag number eight is a weird game that just came out at uh, Essen, and it's called Fold It. And in this, you have this kind of cloth-type paper with different uh, foods on it. And you'll flip a card over it. It'll be like, these are the foods you need to have for the dinner. And then you need to fold this thing up so that only those foods are showing. Hmm. So you're sitting there and like, okay, I'll fold it in half, then fold this part back, and then this underneath here. No, that's stupid. That won't work. Um, and some of them are really hard, but I, it's kind of a unique puzzle game just because you have this like cloth that you're flipping over back and forth trying to fold everything and figure the, hmm. the, the right way to fold it, which is actually the name of the game. It's kind of one of those – I'll do a top ten list sometimes of, like games where their name is on point. This would be <laughs> one of them. Fold it. When I was researching this list, looking at all the puzzle games, games listed as puzzles on BoardGameGeek, this one came up and I went, what? that looks interesting. I, 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 I'd like to check that one out. It does sound like fun. My number eight is Castles of Mad King Ludwig. The biggest part of this game that feels puzzly to me is simply where you're placing the room tiles after you buy them. Since they're not all a single shape or size, like in many other tile placement games, it's not always readily apparent how well certain tiles will fit next to one another. Figuring Mm. out how to build a castle that connects properly and will score you a lot of points helps make this game a little bit more puzzly than others, and it's one I really enjoy. Castles of Mad King Ludwig is my number eight. Number seven. Similarly, my number seven is Factory Fun. I have not played Factory Funner, the uh, sort of re-implementation of the system, but you are, are placing machines that take one colored input and turning it into a different colored output and having to connect all of these into your factory. So not only are you trying to get the flow of a particular type of goo in, in, uh, through, through your, your flow, your, your workflow, but you're also trying to make it work and fit into your system without too much extra piping, which costs you points. Uh, it, it's tricky. There's also a speed element in there, and, and doing puzzles fast is always always difficult. It's my number seven, Factory Fun. Uh, I think you and Z would be fans of this one. Is, is Factory Funner on your list? Didn't I just say that? Sorry. I haven't played Factory <laughs> Funner, no. Eric has not no. played Factory Funner. <laughs> I'm... I'm I was thinking about Tom something doesn't else. Listen. Tom doesn't listen to Hold on, wait, let's go let's let's go to future Eric and see if he's played Factory Funnist yet. <laughs> yes. I was preparing to say that and it was too late. Shut up, but made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Tom is surly. My number seven My is goodness. Mess Machine, which my answer is becoming. Uh, Mess Machine is a semi cooperative game uh, in which you are basically sliding pieces around in this puzzle trying to solve the puzzle together, but you are trying to guess what moves the other players are going to do and also make certain moves yourself, switching pieces around until you solve the puzzle together and score points. Or if you don't solve it, you'll score points, but in a slightly different way. It's very intriguing and interesting game, Mess Machine. My number seven is one that Tom might take issue with. I debated whether I was going to include anything social deduction, or not social deduction, but hidden movement uh, onto my list. It is Specter Ops. While I think a lot of hidden movement games could be argued for inclusion on this list, Specter Ops is the one I think fits best because the tools that the hunters are given allow for very cool and specific tracking abilities in their hunt to try and find the secret agent of ARC. If you use the right abilities at the right time or figure out what tactics the agent is using to throw you off, it makes for a really interesting and I believe puzzly experience. Unless you play the agent like I do and sit in the same square for three turns in a row just to confuse everyone. Spectre Ops, <laughs> my number seven. Can you win sitting in the same spots three turns in a row? 
if I remember correctly, because this game took place not long after the game released, so it's been a little while, I think I was one turn away from escaping when they caught me based on that mm. game. But they had kind of cornered me, and so I sat in the same place for multiple turns, trying to make them think that I had moved farther away to get them to disperse, and it actually kind of worked. So, hmm. That's clever enough that I will not argue with your choice on the list. <laughs> yes! Victory! And I want to be clear, I listened to every single word you just said. All right. <laughs> Funnest. Number six. Number six is, uh, once again, the uh, the very literal uh, interpretation of puzzle as you're trying to get different shaped pieces into a certain size grid. Uh, that's Ubongo. Uh, whoever does that the fastest is going to claim certain colored gems, and then you're playing an area control game. But the, the mechanism that you acquire those gems is place these pieces as quickly as you can. Uh, and certainly the player who, who is most facile at that particular skill is going to do the best in Ubongo, my number six. Did you say the vassal player wins? I didn't say the most vassal. I said facile with an F. Oh, fine. All right. My number six is Gem Blow. Gem Blow is the Korean version, basically, of blo- Blocus. Um, Blocus, you're putting different Tetris-shaped pieces on a board. Gem Blow, they're shaped like hexagon. So they're like weird Tetris pieces that are made up of different hexagons. The thing is, the game works really well with two, three, four, and six players. Five's a little wonky, but and the pieces are these clear gem-looking pieces. It's really a well-done game as you put these pieces um, and having them near each other but not exactly touching and trying to get as many pieces on the board as you possibly can. Very much a puzzle game. Gem Blow. Probably less so a puzzle game would be my number six, which is Captain Sonar. I've been nice to you so far. I just want to clarify that before you continue. He's waiting. No, no. I believe you, and I I have some – I have reasoning. So three out of the four roles to me are puzzly. The one where you're just charging up the systems, 100%, no puzzle there whatsoever. So I will give you that. But the captain has to move the ship away from impassable objects – toward the enemy, and do so while heading in directions that won't damage the ship too much. And that, to Mm. me, is puzzly. The engineer has to figure out which systems to damage and in what order that will allow the sub's abilities to be utilized when they're most needed, and so you don't have to surface the sub. Uh, And you have to account for silent running and other hindrances as well. Uh, The radio operator has to use the transparency to suss out where the enemy ship is located. If that's not a puzzle, shifting that thing around on the the little map, I don't know what is. (laughs) It's, I mean, the whole thing is frantic and wonderful, and yes, it's deduction more than puzzle, but I haven't played a lot of the games on your all's lists, so I had to be creative with my choices. This game is a lot of fun. I think it's puzzly. It's my number six, Captain Sonar. You're I'll very, allow it. You're very good at this. This justificational purposes. I, 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 uh, I you have actually, to anticipate the arguments. I had asked a friend of mine when I was making the list for some input, just to you know see what they thought, and they said this isn't a puzzle game. And I kind of gave them that quick and dirty explanation, and they went, "Oh, I guess it is kind of puzzly." So, <laughs> well, outside I'm mollified, but I just want you to know, in my heart, I know you're wrong. You know what? I'm okay <laughs> with that. I think I can live with that. Okay, number five. My number five is Fitz. Fill in the spaces. Reiner Knizia's puzzle game uh, where you're dropping vertically uh, different shaped pieces and trying to fill in as much of, or at least in strategic places of your board as possible to earn the most points. It's a lot like Tetris, although you can't shift your pieces near the bottom of the board, which always sort of bothered me. But you're dropping these pieces down and trying to fill in most efficiently. Fitz, F-I-T-S, my number five. Just as a quick public service announcements, there's a sequel to this game called Bits, which is not Mm -hmm. nearly as good. Ah. My number five is very similar to Eric's number eight. Eric's number eight was Take It Easy. My number five is Take It to the Limit. They are essentially the same game. Take It to the Limit is just a bigger, more grandiose version of Take It Easy. Hmm. It has bigger boards. That's pretty much it. Okay. In these games, you one person is drawing a tile and then placing it on the board. Everyone else has to take that exact same tile and put it on their board, and you are going to get points for having rows of the same color or columns or diagonal uh, lines of different colors. The problem is you're not going to be able to make them all match up. 
And so you have to figure out the best way to put them on. I, I, it's a game that technically you could play with 200,000 people, I guess, mm-hmm. Beca- at the same time because you could just call out a tile and everyone puts it on their board. Right. And it's very much a solitaire-style game, but you're getting the same puzzle everyone else gets. And I don't know. I find the game very, very satisfying. You'll never get it done perfectly. I have never have. Right. It's almost a push-your-luck puzzle game because as you – at first, you're like, I can maintain this connection and I can maintain this connection. Oh, and then at some point you can't maintain them all. So which ones do you hope you're going to be able to continue and which ones do you give up on? And that's where the, the strategy diverges. That's take it easy or take it to the limit. Well, my number five actually shows up higher on Eric's list. So for now, I'm just going to drink this pink thing and hope something good happens. What? what? That's always a good plan. What? <laughs> Number four. Number four is Paradox. Uh, This is uh, very similar to the the match three concept of puzzles. um, That you, in order to gain resources for uh, saving the universe from a time anomaly. We'll get to that later. That's not the puzzly part. uh, You need to match different, uh, for lack of a better word, gems, tokens on your array in order to to get these resources. Uh, It's not quite a a slidey Switch 3 puzzle. You actually get to swap them, um, but you only get two moves a turn. So are you trying to score uh, with one move, or are you setting up for maybe a bigger payoff with two? And how do you make all this work and and, uh, stay efficient? Paradox, my number four. My number four is either Ricochet Robots or Mutant Meeples, and I think... It's fair to put them together because they are almost the same game. Mutant Meeples Meeples has powers. Right. It's Ricochet Robots with superhero powers. It's actually easier because of these powers than Ricochet Robot is. And sometimes I'm in the mood for the easier version with the cool superpowers. And sometimes I want to play the sometimes quite difficult Ricochet Robot. In this game, you're just trying to get a robot from one spot to another, and you are moving around the board. They can move in a straight line until they hit a wall, then bounce in either direction. And you're bouncing them off each other, trying to figure out the fastest way to get one robot from one spot to another. It can be quite tricky, and you can play as many people as can sit around a table. You'll notice many of these puzzle games can have quite large groups because it's mm-hmm. just everyone trying to solve a puzzle the fastest. That's Ricochet Robots or Me- Mutant Meeples. I almost put this on my list despite the fact that I have played neither game. <laughs> that makes no sense. <laughs> it, it, I've just heard so much about it, and I'm like, this is a perfect fit. I wish I had played it so I could actually say whether I enjoy it or not. I feel like that with a couple of the inclusions on both of your lists. So, <laughs> so my number four is Sagrada. In addition to being really pretty to look at, this dice drafting game about creating stained glass windows forces you to think strategically about where to place your dice on your board based on a whole bunch of placement rules and how to best utilize the tools that are available in any given game to break those rules when need be. The game is fairly new, but it has quickly become one of my favorites, and I don't see myself tiring of puzzling out how to fill in my window anytime soon. Sagrada is my number four. Just to clarify from previous ones, this is an excellent choice. Ooh. <laughs> I don't want people to think I'm all negative here. I feel very special right now. Eric, have you played Sagrada yet? I have not played Sagrada, no. I think you would like it. Okay. I'll, I'm, I'll add I'm it to mildly the list. obsessed with it. Mildly obsessed? Yeah, okay. just mildly. <laughs> sure. <laughs> just a little bit of obsession. All right, cool. Only let's on Tuesdays. People who, let's get to some entries now that break some of my core rules. Okay. Number three. My number three almost didn't make it on the list. It made it just in time. But then I noticed that um, someone else has it on their list. So um, back to square one for me. Well, you were – never mind. All right. My number three is Cottage Garden, which is kind of like Eric's number nine, Patrick, except it's way more fun. Mm. Patchwork is actually a pretty good game, don't get me wrong. It's a great two-player tiling game, but Cottage Garden works for two, three, and four players, has a really fun theme and a beautiful board, and you get to build multiple boards. It's just it's all about the laying the tile pieces and less about this movement around and this weird button economy. I like that they kind of cut that out. I think I like Cottage Garden. Well, I shouldn't say I think. I know I like Cottage Garden better. I'm not sure. If I like Baron Park better, I have not yet played it. Probably by the time this video goes up, I will have had played it. Yes, future present. Um, <laughs> but at this point in time, I really enjoy Cottage Garden. 
Yeah, I, I think Patchwork gets the nod from me, though. I, I, I feel like I, I like that button economy, and, and I, I just felt like too much was going on in Cottage Garden. My number three is Kingdom Builder. This 2012 Spiel des Jahres winner is an anomaly in my list of favorite board games of all time, as most of my favorite games are highly thematic, and Kingdom Builder is pretty bland when it comes to theming. Uh, Ever since my first play of the game three or four years ago, I was enamored by the game's simplicity. It has a lot of strategic depth, and the simple act of placing three settlements, if done well, can open up your kingdom to a lot of varied opportunities, and trying to figure out where best to place those settlements to give you additional opportunities is what makes the game so interesting to me, Uh, along with the action tiles that allow you to manipulate things further, Uh, While I am a little bit upset that I still do not have my big box with the last two expansions from the Queen Games Kickstarter that funded in March of 2016, Queen Games, please give me my big box. Uh, I love this game anyway, and I'll play it any time. Kingdom Builder is my number three. I apologize for not clarifying when we made this list that it had to have fun games on it. Oh, man. That's so mean. I I I cannot justify or explain why I like this game so much. Honestly, it does not fit. Anyone that knows me and my taste in games is baffled by the fact that I like this one so much, and <laughs> I'm kind of baffled by it too. So there you go. I, I think you've nailed it. It's it's the puzzle aspect. How do I use this particular set of rules for this game to uh, you know, maximize my, my efficiency? Because I have had people who play it for the first time get very frustrated when they place their first few settlements in a bad location and end up stuck not being able to expand the way that they want to. And so Mm. I try when I explain the game to explain that nuance from the get-go, but it's something that takes a little bit of time to get good at. Number two. Moving on to my number two, this was Tom's number nine, and that's uh, Dimension, which is a three-dimensional ball stacking game you're you're given a set of parameters and then you have to very quickly assemble this pyramid of of colored balls to fit all of those rules uh as efficiently as possible and as tom mentioned hopefully before your opponents it's tricky i've only played a few demos of this and i was still fascinated by it uh and it really fits the parameters of puzzle game absolutely can you fit all of these rules how do you do that if you place this ball here it's not going to it's going to break the rule that you were trying to solve by that other placement and and then your brain freezes but it's still fun dimension my number two tom's number nine yeah, Dimension is, is very interesting. I like how sometimes it's impossible to follow all the rules, so you just try to do the rules that you can possibly do, and it's just very satisfying. It's, I think it's also a game that pe- it's easier for a lot of people to do, so it works well. This is the favorite game of one of my best friends in my gaming group, and somehow she and I have just never linked up so I could try it with her, and it's been Mm. on my short list to try for quite some time now, and I do need to play it. It looks very interesting. Now, my number two is tricky for me because it's also a deduction game, and I didn't put deduction Mm. games on my list for the most part. But Zendo, because it has moving pieces and it's not like solving a case or anything, it's figuring out how these pieces fit together in a logical fashion. So I'm calling it a puzzle game, although I will accept the beating from people who think it's not. I mean, I feel like I should give you grief just because, but truthfully, I, I don't want to. <laughs> no, I'm all, I will accept it. I, I, I don't like actually Zendo know so Zendo, much. so I couldn't give you grief if I wanted. Yeah, okay, but I am I will accept my punishment, and maybe I should have cut this one, but I really do like Zendo. I'm really excited about the upcoming reprint of it, trying to figure out what that person was trying to do with those pieces, to me it's kind of a puzzle as you put the pieces together yourself. That may be stretching the definition, so let's go over to Crystal. No, I mean, I agree. I agree, too. It, it's certainly a puzzle game. It's just with our self-imposed, uh, you know, leaving the deduction games out, um, you know, it, it's a deduction game. For the record, I did not self-impose that rule on myself at all, so... <laughs> well, all right, then. For, for me, <laughs> yeah, that's why I didn't put it on there. But I did... With, you know, I used my brain to make sure that Eric and I were going to sync up in at least one way that Tom could give both of us grief about, because it wouldn't Excellent. be a oh, good boy. top ten list unless that could happen. So Yay. <laughs> my number two, which was Eric's number three, is Time Stories. Yay! It is unlike any other game I've ever played. Time Stories truly feels like a choose-your-own-adventure game where you get to explore 
as many of the possible paths as you want. It's not like the book and when you were a kid and you get to the end and you just died and you have to flip back. You get to keep doing it over and over. And sometimes it's frustrating and perilous, but it ultimately leads to a satisfying conclusion. Trying to figure out where to go and what to do and in what order is one of my favorite parts of this game. It's spectacular in so many ways. I've played every scenario that has been released, aside from the new scenario that just came out. Uh, I am sure it will be hitting my table in the very near future. There are. This is a puzzle game because there are pieces that need to be brought from one part of the game sphere to another. There are uh, things that must be solved. There's all sorts of pieces to manipulate in this and there is a solution to it which is why uh this this uh, made my list as well um this is the only episode of your podcast crystal that i have not completed because i have a couple of scenarios i haven't worked through yet and i didn't want you to spoil it for me well that was a fun episode for us to record i believe it doesn't have uh expedition endurance because we we released it before that one was out but it has all of the other scenarios prior to that included well another one just came out today guys that's what I just oh. said. <laughs> He's really not listening. He doesn't <laughs> listen to us at all. Wait, what did you just say? You said Operation Endurance. No, I, I said you. when I and when I was describing it, I said I've played every scenario aside from the new one that just came out. Okay, I thought you meant Operation Endurance. Sorry. Oh no, this uh, Simper Fide or what's it called? I don't remember the. Uh. That's the one that just was released. I played yeah, Expedition I Endurance. S- I actually had a very disappointing experience with that, but I can't elaborate on it at all without spoiling things, so that's not very interesting. <laughs> you can tell me later. I will oh, definitely boy. let you know. I got stuck on Under the Mask because it was unavailable for a while, and so I finally got that in when they reprinted. So I love was- Time Stories, and I'm not going <laughs> to give you guys garbage on this because there are puzzles in it. I do wonder if it fits into the... Uh, Escape room in a box, almost. You're not always escaping, but yeah, I get it. It's, I mean, if you're talking about it like quantum leap. No, but let's say, let's yeah. say Time Stories came out right now. If Time Stories came out right now, I'd be like, wow, this is a really cool variation on the escape room games. Right. Yeah. It's Quantum Leap, the board game. But it was also, when it was presented, uh, I always described it as it's like um, Mist. Or King's Quest on a board game. That's an interesting comparison. I really loved The Mist and Zork and all of those types of games when I was younger. Yeah. And that might be why I gravitate towards something like Time Stories. So I guess that's why it was my number two and Eric's number three. Indeed. And finally, number one. My number one was Crystal's number five. That's Potion Explosion, although I really wanted to put Unlock on there because it's the best of all of them. But okay, anyway. It is um, not the best of all of them. Exit is better than Unlock. I like Unlock better. It's the best. (laughs) Anyway, Potion Explosion is definitely a puzzle game because you need a particular set of gems to fulfill your potion. And and you're looking at that, trying to figure out how to use one pull of the marbles to set off a chain reaction. But maybe you, if you get help from the professor and just remove, or maybe if I use these, these two potions, I can arrange the board so that I'm ready to do the one pull that sets off the chain reaction I need. It, it, it can get brain hurdy. Um, if you really try and think about it, or you just grab one and hope for the best potion explosion, my number one, because unlock couldn't make it. Yeah. I, I put that as my number five. I think especially not just, pulling the right marble to chain a whole bunch of explosions, but figuring out how to utilize your existing potions to set up the even better chain reaction is Mm -hmm. one of the most cool and puzzly parts of it. And this was uh, kind of what I was talking about in our earlier discussion. I've actually played the app version of Potion Explosion a lot. And I, when I, brought out the board game i was like man i feel like i'm, I'm really good at this now <laughs> so <laughs> it uh it definitely helped improve and the app implementation is one of the best that i've encountered thus far and you don't you don't fumble any of the marbles with the app well i do okay i have on one certain one or two occasions i've clicked on the wrong marble and there's no undo button on the app no so that- there is no that is a bummer because it's like, come on, the game should know. I'm, I'm not taking one marble and just settling, but, you know, that's <laughs> neither here nor there. <laughs> the game should know that you're better than that. It should at this point. Come on, AI. I still haven't had anyone explain to me how the app for Potion Explosion isn't just like an app for one of these Bejeweled It, it is stuff. just an app. Well, Bejeweled well, is when you're Well, it plays Potion moving. Explosion. 
Bejeweled is you, you're moving things, like you're switching the positions of two different things to make matches, whereas in Potion Explosion, you're taking something out to make a chain reaction. I, I, I don't I, know. I, I understand that. I'm just saying I don't see how this is any different than just one of the apps that this board game was based on to begin with. Well, Tom, because the difference you're is this makes us cooler because we're not sitting around playing Candy Crush. We're playing a board game on our phone. <laughs> exactly. I'm glad you're acknowledging the, the the irony of it all, but yes, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Oh yeah, no this this whole thing is an exercise in futility, but I will argue it until I'm blue in the face, just because it's fun to do. <laughs> all right, my number one is a feast for Odin. Now, feast for Odin is yet another one of these fill in the grids like patchwork and cottage garden and barren park and stuff, but this one is the heaviest of all of them. And yes, there's a lot of resources and worker placement and all that, but it all comes down to, the whole game comes down to filling in this grid with all kinds of weird shapes. Definitely a puzzle game in my book. It's certainly more complex, and there definitely is other things in work, but when it comes down to it, it's all about how do you get these pieces to cover up these negative point spots. Really enjoy it. Feast for Odin. I agree it belongs on the list. It probably shortlisted mine. I... I think I just saw it more as a worker placement game than puzzle, but you're, you're winning me over with your argument. My number one game is King Domino. I was first introduced to this game in March at MeepleCon, and it has become the most played game for me since that time. I have not played really? any other game more. The basic game where you build a 5x5 five five grid feels mildly puzzly, but not nearly as much as it, when you play the two-player variant where you're building a 7x7 seven seven grid. It always burns my br- brain and trying to figure out not only where you're allowed to place tiles, but where it's best to because you know that all the other tiles in the game are eventually coming out. Figuring mm. out what the best strategy is is wonderful. And you sometimes have to throw away tiles, and I tend to do that whenever I play the 7x7. Seven In fact, I've recently acquired a second copy of the game because I heard that the designer said you can add a second copy of the game and build a 9 by 9 grid. I haven't done it yet, (laughs) but I'm going to. And I'm looking forward to it. It's going to cause me a metaphorical headache, I'm sure. But I'm, I'm, I'm ready for the challenge. And that is why King Domino is my number one puzzly game. Have you memorized the the tiles yet so you know that the 33 is a particular arrangement? I have not. I've made it a point not to necessarily pay attention to which numbers correlate to which tiles. I always have the back of the the rule book available so I know how many of each specific tile are in the game. But Hmm. I, I can see by the numbers whether it's likely to have crowns or not just because the higher numbers have more crowns than the lower numbers. So right. when, when the next set comes out, I'll be like, oh, those are all high numbers. They probably all have crowns on them. But I won't remember which specific types of land are on them. And I suppose I could try and do that, but it would kind of ruin some of the fun for me, I think. think hmm. So I don't plan on doing that. <laughs> well... This is a very intriguing. I'm just still so kind of surprised it's number one. It's definitely a puzzle game, but wow, very, very well, high up there. This is a list of my favorite puzzle games, and King Domino is kind of my favorite everything right now. So there you go. <laughs> well, I, I, I hear that. Yeah, you, when, one's, when one's particularly hot, you, can't, uh, you so, almost can't get it out of your mind when, when thinking about a particular list. All right, let's see what the people say. Number 10, they said Quirkle. Which hmm. makes sense. Very puzzly Scrabble type game. Number nine, Potion Explosion. Number eight, Ubongo, which definitely is a puzzle style game. Number seven, Pandemic. Pandemic. Always Pandemic. Thanks, Always. everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Pandemic is a puzzle you must solve, as is every board game in existence. Why are we even doing this list? <laughs> Actually, there was several of the... the, the uh, Escape room games in those lists, but I cut them. See, Tom makes the rules. That's right. I this do. isn't the people's choice. This is the people's choices determined by Tom. It's your <laughs> modified choices, people. <laughs> it's through the filter of Tom, the vassal filter. Number six is Blokus. Number five, Castle of Mad King Ludwig. Number four, Feast for Odin. Number three, Cottage Garden. Number two, Karuba. That's a bit interesting one. And number one, Patchwork. Mm. So there you go, Eric. 
I didn't expect that to be number one, but okay. I don't get it. This patchwork thing is fen- is this phenomenon to me. It's like super high on board game geek. It's like in the top forty games. I I get that people like patchwork. I understand that it's a it's a neat little game, but what is with this insane love for this game? It's not that fantastic. The buttons are hypnotic. Submit to the buttons, Tom. I I am submitting. I'm buttoning my mouth now. I've made so Submit many mistakes this episode. I need to wash this episode out. My Crystal is she's the new co-host. <laughs> Woo! I'm excited, Eric. You and me together. All right, forever. here we go. <laughs> Best buds. Well, Crystal, so, so is this the part where I say, and now you and you've been listening to the Dice Tower. Thank you for listening. <laughs> yes. Promotional support is provided by <laughs> viewers like you. Thank you for your continued support. And then there's a pun, but I don't have one ready. And wow, she really memorizes you, Eric. This she is, really is ready to go. Never Wait, mind, yeah. actually, Eric. Am I, am I a creeper? Hold on. You Eric, gave her an I, opening, and she just grabbed it. Well Eric, done. you've been good, but you know, I just realized I actually can stay on. <laughs> ah, oh, but, okay. But, it's a fight to the death. Who gets to be co-host but Eric, with Crystal? Um, looks like we don't need your ending anymore. So I, I guess Crystal's got it taken care of. I haven't come up with a pun yet either. Future well, Eric deals with that. If nothing else, it has been an absolute pleasure to be on the show. Thank you guys so much for allowing me to join you. I hope that I get to come back again at some point in the future. But this has just been a blast. So thank you so much. You bet. And I'm excited to meet you at uh, Dice Tower Con in just a couple weeks. Yay, I'm excited to meet you too. Ah, I'm so excited. All right. Well, thank you, Crystal. We appreciate you coming on the show. Folks, thanks so much for listening to another episode of the Dice Tower. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Crystal Pisano. And I'm Eric Summerer. And you've been listening to the Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode number 511 was recorded on June 22nd, 2017. Coming up next week, Tom and I talk about this year's Spiel des Jahres nominees. Support for this podcast comes from listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. Find out more about the fund's mission and how you can help at jackvassal.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom and me with production assistance from Itai Perez, Derek Porter, and Rob Seary. Our theme was composed by Timothy Pinkham. Subterranean military engagements brought to you by this mine of war. And hosting is provided by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games at great prices at coolstuffinc.com. We love feedback. Visit the Dice Tower Guild at boardgamegeek.com. Email us at dicetower at gmail.com or follow us on Facebook. And, of course, you can find more from the Dice Tower Network, including the Out of Game Podcast, 20 Minutes of Filler, the Snakes Cast, the D6 Generation, Blue Peg, Pink Peg, the Family Gamers, the Portal Gaming Podcast, and Board Game Breakfast at dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower... Have fun gaming. I don't know. Riled up Tom's pretty fun. What can we do to get him at this level every episode? Well, that would be me me on as the co-host, obviously. (laughs) I think it's just that I haven't stopped working for many, many hours. Um, But I'm I'm really listening to you guys. Um, Mm -hmm. So, Ambie, thanks for coming on again. (laughs) Hey, at least I didn't bring up the uh, the pooping Romans game that we played two years ago at MeepleCon. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I and won I was, that game. And I was cheating because I would kept using my phone to think of more euphemisms to use in that game. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, you, Z, and Sam, every time it got around to your turns, it was just more poop euphemisms. There's a lot, Eric. There's over 100. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> Maybe we can do a, an encore at Dice Tower Con. <laughs> poop euphemisms part duh. <laughs> Now I'm really excited. It's definitely part two. Um, but <laughs> Oh, gosh. It's I, definitely number two. Definitely. I got fancy and ruined the joke. Number two. Oh, number two. Oh, man.